All right, so I'm going to talk to you guys about, um, mostly in this video, about drug testing and, and approval process of <clears throat> around drug testing, clinical trust testing. But um, I, before I do that, I want to kind of run you through who's in charge of regulating some of this stuff. So here's kind of the layout of the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. So the FDA is essentially the regulating agency that's responsible for making sure that drugs and medical devices are both safe and effective, right? And we talked about how all that kind of came into being with all that legis the significant legislation um, earlier in an earlier video. Um, the FDA was established by President Lincoln in 1862 and um, it was expanded significantly after the um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. So you can kind of see the layout. At the top we have the Office of the Commissioner, and then we have essentially um, seven branches of the FDA. All of the, for our purposes, the drugs New drugs are approved by the Center for Drug Evaluation um, and Research, right here, or the CDER. So they have to be approved before they can be marketed, and that includes over-the-counter drugs like we talked about before. So when we're talking about drug testing in a minute, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research is who the drug companies petition for the INDs, and also who they bring their data back after they've done com completed their clinical trials. And then ultimately that branch of the FDA decides whether or not a drug is going to go to market and whether or not it's gonna be an over-the-counter drug or a prescription drug. And then the attorney general, as we said earlier, will be the one that will place the drugs, the scheduled drugs on the schedule one through five. Um, there's also the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, and they're overseeing dietary supplements and cosmetics. Um, so the FDA is responsible for saying, yeah, we can test these drugs. Also responsible for um, advertising, making sure advertising is in line for, for prescription drugs as well. All right. So let's get into this a little bit. Um, the D Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, so not the FDA, but the DEA, the DEA is in charge of the um, drug enforcement f around controlled substances, pardon me. So they're controlling the distribution and sale of drugs. So basically we have manufacture and distribution being overseen by the FDA and then distribution and sale um, being, I think I said distribution twice, I didn't mean to say that. The FDA is manu testing and manufacturing and ultimately coming to market and then distribution and sale is the DEA. So it kind of makes sense if you think about it that we separate the group that's approving the drugs from the dr group that's enforcing drug legislation. And that hopefully would is reasonable to you, right? Because it's, you know, we're humans and tend to be able to be persuaded one way or the other, especially when there's a lot of money on the line, which is the case with drugs, as I'm sure you all know. So we separate those two, those two very important factions, if you will. All right, then we've got the Federal Trade Commission, and those guys are in charge of advertising of over-the-counter drugs, misleading advertising. Remember, this is something that came out of all that early legislation. You can't do any misleading advertising, right? You cannot say, you can't make a claim, a false claim, or really any claim um, on the label. So that's, the, if it's a over-the-counter medication, then it's the Federal Trade Commission. The FDA is responsible for advertising for prescription medications. Interestingly, you might find this interesting, um, our United States and New Zealand are the only two countries that actually allow prescription uh, drugs to be advertised. They don't have, you know, all those drug commercials we have, you don't have those other, in other places other than here in New Zealand, which I think is sort of interesting. But in our country, the FDA is responsible for making sure that the advertising of 
prescription medications is done to to the specifications that they lay out. All right, so let's talk about drug testing and approval. So there's some basic steps that are needed to bring a drug to the market, starting from the design of the test um, and then moving into animal, so lab data, animal data, and then into the four phases of human clinical trials before we can actually get something to the market. So that's what's in, ter in the terms of FDA approval, that process starts in the lab and ends uh, with human testing. So these numbers are different and they're different probably in your book and they're different everywhere, but um, on average, it takes about 12 years and about $200 million to bring a drug to the market. Sometimes you'll find a, you know, a much larger number on that. Um, um, you know, I, I've, I found up to $800 million. But what these numbers oftentimes, and it's kind of hard depending on where your source is, it's sort of hard to figure out what they're actually counting. Oftentimes, the drug companies don't get it right first time out of the box, right? So they have to go back to the drawing board multiple times. And oftentimes those really hefty price tags of like $800 million, well, $200 million is not a small amount of money, but they'll encompass all their failed attempts and the cost of their failed attempts. And so they'll ball that all up into one total. So there's a lot of variability depending on where your source is in terms of how much it actually costs and how long it really takes. But you can pretty safely say on average, it's about 12 years from beginning to approval to ready to market um, and about $200 million or more. All right, so again, the steps is first we do lab testing, then we do animal trials. Most drugs don't get past that stage. After they get their data from the lab and they get their data from the animal trials, then they petition the FDA. And if the FDA says, okay, then they'll give them an investigational new drug approval or an IND. And then they'll go into cl human clinical trials. So they can't begin to test these drugs on humans until they've got that IND in hand. All right, so once we transition into the human trials, the human clinical trials are set up as there's um, trial, human tri clinical trial stage one, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then I put phase four in italics because they're um, a little, it's, that's a little fuzzy, but stage one, two, and three is pretty straightforward. Sorry, my phone started. Siri thought I had a question, so she was answering me. Uh, okay, so here's sort of a timeline, drug development timeline. And again, this is arbitrary because it's very generic, but sort of an average. So you can see the preclinical research happens before you get the IND approval, which is right here, right? So the FDA is the one that grants that. Then we have human clinical trial phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one is the shortest, phase two is not much longer, phase three is the longest. At the end, if everything is a go, then they, the drug company petitions the FDA, gives them all their data, they evaluate all their data, and if it's a go, then they get a new drug approval. So they get a new drug approval, it gets accepted, and then it gets approved, and then the drug goes to market. And you can see that's, you know, that's where we're talking about like 10 years here, 15 years, 20 years. And the reason why the time is important is because when a new drug comes to the market, the drug company that brought it to the market owns it until, for it owns it until, on in most cases, 17 years from the time they started in the lab to the time the patent expires. And so if, you know, it's 12 years or so by the time the drug gets to market, in this case, more than 15, they'd only have like a year or two or, you know, upwards of three, two, three, you know, somewhere on average, probably like three years to make all their money back. So that's the significance of the time. And then you see this bit here, this is what we refer to as sta um, stage five phase five, or pardon me, phase four, 
which is called post-marketing surveillance. I'll talk more about that in a minute. So again, the preclinical testing, this is not humans. This is in the lab, right? And then it's going to be moving on to animals. So drugs are evaluated in the lab, and there's not a lot of information you can get in the lab in a preclinical test. Toxicities, pharmacokinetic properties, potential useful biologic effects. And this is all lab, right? This can take a while, one to five years. All right. Um, if I... Uh, pardon me, as we start to talk about clinical trials, I want to talk about differences in clinical trials. So the best design, and, and, and I should say um, trial design, clinical trial design, the best is going, kind of the gold standard is the um, double blind random clinical trial. And so randomized clinical trials are used to evaluate all new drugs. And essentially what a randomized clinical trial is all about is it uses a control group, it randomizes the population, and it blinds the testers. So there's different ways to blind. A single blind would be the subjects are blinded, meaning that they don't know if they're getting the, the actual drug or the in most cases if they use the control group gets a placebo, which is a blank essentially. So if it's single blinded, that means that the people participating in the study don't know if they're getting the actual drug or the placebo. If it's double blind, which is considered the gold standard, then the people that are administering the drug and the people that are receiving the drug, so the researchers and the subjects are both blinded. They don't know who's getting what. So that's considered the gold standard. And that's because nobody knows what's up and it's a little, it's more objective theoretically. All right, so let's look at these trials. So phase one, human clinical trial. So who's gonna get these drugs? This is gonna be a small group of people and they are gonna be healthy volunteers. They do not have the condition that the drug is ultimately des designated to treat. What we're trying to figure out here, and these are short, the shortest of the three human clinical trials. What we're trying to figure out here is how bioavailable the drug is, and that means how, 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 uh, how can I just say, say that? Bioavailability refers to the amount of dr active drug that's available to hit the receptor. That's what bioavailability refers to. So we're going to get some of that information, and we're going to get safety information and toxicity information. These are healthy people. We're giving a healthy pe people a new drug and basically waiting to see what happens. We can get a little bit of information about efficacy and potency, but it only will really, efficacy is, potency, yeah, maybe, but efficacy really only is at play if the subject is also a patient, which they usually are not in a phase one trial. Phase two trials, human clinical trials. So now we're gonna, again, they're gonna be pretty small and they're not gonna be very long because we haven't given this drug to very many people yet, but the people who are gonna get this drug are people who actually need the drug therapeutically, so they have the condition that the drug is supposed to treat. So what we're gonna get to d get out of this is a few more people, and we're gonna get to actually look at some efficacy to see if it works, right, compared to the placebo. So we're gonna compare the response with the placebo and the response from the drug and see what happens? So the control group is the placebo group. They're the non-treatment group. So why would we want to do this? Well, we're going to give a few more people and for a little bit longer time. So in addition to the effic efficacy, we're also going to get some more information on safety and potential toxicity. Potency and efficacy also is included because these are people who actually need the drug. Phase three, this is going to be the biggest. This is going to be an expanded clinical trial on patients who actually can benefit from the drug. There are going to be more people and it's going to be a much longer period of time. So what you're going to get out of this, the longer, the more people you have enrolled and you have taking the drug and the longer they're taking it, you're going to get a lot more data on usefulness of the drug. And also we're going to start to potentially see some adverse effects. 
or side effects, right? Some of the more rare side effects. The longer people take them and the more people having taking them, the more likely we're gonna see some of these adverse effects. So at the end of all of this, the drug company takes all that information, they give it back to the FDA, the FDA reevaluates all the data, and then if it's favorable, the company can file what we call a new drug application. So the new drug application essentially then has to go to a new drug approval, which can take some time, and then the drug comes to the market. So this is where we're trying to, and this is some of the more recent drug legislation, is to try to streamline this process to, to sort of fast track it a bit, especially um, in drugs that are re really relevant and needed. Then we've got phase four, and I put that in italics because it's a very loose. This is called the post-marketing surveillance. So after, this is after the drug is being sold on the market. It's being marketed, it's being prescribed, people are taking it. For the first few years, we're supposed to be monitoring it for efficacy and more importantly, safety, looking, at ad looking for adverse drug reactions. Um, there's some, there's a little bit of challenge in my mind to this phase because first of all, if, you f if something seems to be up with the drug that may not be looking so good, then what's supposed to happen is the prescriber or the person that's interfacing with the patient or the patient themselves are supposed to contact the company and the company is supposed to collect this data and monitor it. And if it's sufficiently worrisome, then they're supposed to report that to the FDA and then go through, potentially look at going through getting this drug taken off of the market. So there's some inherent challenges in that, one of which is a bit of a conflict of interest, right? They've just now spent, you know, upwards of $200 million on this drug and they want to make some of that money back for good reason. That's reasonable. But the time to make the money back is in those first few years, right? Because that's when the drug is owned by them and they can charge whatever they want for it. And usually, of course, these drugs that are new are expensive. And as they go off patent and we get generics, which we'll talk about later, then they get cheaper. So there's that part of this. Um, however, the FDA does have a database that is uh, called the Adverse Event Reporting System. It's a computerized database. And essentially all these adverse reactions that get reported by the manufacturers, providers, and patients go into this adverse event, event reporting system. And the FDA is supposed to evaluate that. The FDA also has annual meetings that are open to the public that um, are a venue for people to you know, comment on safety and efficacy of new drugs. Okay, let's look at some, let's see if we can figure this out. So here's an advertisement that I can't remember where I got, but um, this is kind of what we see. So let's see if we can figure out what phase this, so this is for, this is an advertisement for a clinical trial. So we see that we have compensation up to $790 for your time and travel, which is a pretty good amount of money. The qualifications, male or females, between the ages of 18 to 65 and generally healthy. So what phase do you think this is? Hopefully you're saying phase one. And the way we know it's phase one is A, it's, and there's a pretty good compensation, and the other thing is we have generally healthy volunteers. Healthy volunteers are the only, the only time we use healthy volunteers is in phase one. Um, just as an aside, who do you think they market phase one trials to most of the time? Hopefully you said college students, people who are generally healthy and like, and are generally poor, need some money. So college students are a target. If you walk around campus, you'll see signs up all the time for clinical trials, human clinical trials, mostly phase one. And if it says healthy volunteer, you know it's phase one. All right, here's another one. Uh, this is hard to see, but it says, are you taking Ambien? Pacific Sleep Medicine is currently participating in a national clinical research study of an investigational use for an approved 
prescription sleep medication. So this is a drug that's already been approved, but they're looking at using it for another purpose. If you're interested in participating in this clinical study, you must be A, undergoing treatment for at least three months, currently using Ambien for at least four nights per week, and be willing to discontinue and amp continue Ambien. So we don't um, ha know, we say, it does say they're gonna be compensated, but we don't know what that's gonna be. Um, but we do know that they have to be currently be treated for Ambien. So this could be a phase two, clin or a phase two or a phase three. We don't really know because in both cases we would be um, getting people that have the, a use for the medication. And we don't know how long and how many people are enrolled. If it was a really big one, um, it would most likely be phase three. If it's a smaller one, it would be phase two, small, smaller and shorter. Okay, so once a drug is approved, then we got this patent business. I was talking about that. So patent lasts for usually 17 to 20 years. It kind of depends. And sometimes it'll extend the patent if it took an extraordinarily long time and a lot of money to get that drug approved. But it's from the time the IND is obtained through approval. And on average, that takes somewhere between seven to 12 years. So if it takes, let's say seven, let's just say, let's just say ballpark 10 years, then and the patent expires at 17 years. So essentially they have seven years to make their money back. After the patent expires, at that point, any other drug company can make that drug that's already been approved without having to go through the whole process as long as they make it to the standard that was approved and outlined in the USP. So anyone can make it as long as they, and, and the thing is that essentially the, the generics have to be, have to have all the same active ingredients. If they have all the same active ingredients, then that would be a generic. All right, so um, again, the deal here is what this what really, really this is giving us an, uh, an in, some insight into is to why is it that these these non generics are so expensive? And again, the reason for that is because they've got to make the money back. Once a drug goes to generic and everyone can make it, then and it doesn't cost them, you know, they don't have to do all the studies. They've already been done. They just make the drug, and so it doesn't cost them anything. And so these generics tend to be quite a bit cheaper. And so in that period where that before the patent is expired, the drug companies really want to make up that money. So here's something I got. This is kind of an old reference, but um, it's sort of interesting. It's from the Journal of Health Economics, and it's looking at kind of like what really are the costs, you know? And so this is where I said there's some, some variation in the numbers. So on average, it takes from phase one to approval, so from the IND to approval, about seven years. The estimated cost, including the cost of all the failed attempts, is somewhere around 800 million, which is a pretty consistent number. I find that number a lot. Um, you know, and again, 50% of that figure, that $800 million figure, is the cost of the capital needed to finance the research and development over such a long period of time. There's a lot of expense that goes into this. All right, so in terms of testing and the challenges with test design. So we, you know, we kind of laid it out and said, yeah, random double blind randomized clinical trial is the best way to go. Um, but it's, it's not that black and white, right? It's still pretty gray. And the reasons for that, I want to kind of touch on a little bit. Um, so in terms of efficacy, so remember the e efficacy is the maximum effect produced by the drug. Right, that's the how good the drug is at provide at at um, at producing that response, not related to dose potency. If you recall, was the amount of drug necessary um, that it, the amount of drug you need to give to produce that response, not related to the maximum effect. But um, oh, I'm sorry, I guess we're gonna look at these terms a little bit more. Um, so here's just a graph showing us the difference between efficacy and potency. So we're just looking at two drugs. The weight, the doses are arbitrary, and the percent relief would be the the efficacy over here, right? So this would be the dose. This would be the efficacy. We're gonna have a drug that's it gonna drug A is gonna be orange, and drug B is gonna be um, blue. So here we have we administer it. The efficacy doesn't get it doesn't get, and this is characteristic. You could take way more drug A, doesn't matter, and it's that's the most you're gonna get. 
in terms of symptom relief, 40%. Drug B, however, as you increase the dose, you get all the way up to 60%. So drug A might be more potent, spikes earlier, but drug B is more efficacious. As you continue to get, give it, they're going to get more, uh, more relief. Here's another one, drug C and drug D. So here we have drug C, here we have drug D. So which one's more potent? Which one spikes first? Hopefully you're saying drug C. Which one's more efficacious? Hopefully you're saying equally effic equal efficacy. Both C and D are equally efficacious because both of them produce 60% symptom relief. Oh, <laughs> guess we're gonna do it again. Here's drug E, 100%, you're never gonna see that. Here's drug F, less potent, less efficacious. Here's drug A, equally potent, but less efficacious, the least efficacious. So E and A are equally potent, but A is more efficacious. In second place for efficacy would be drug F, and in last place for efficacy would be drug A. So that's kind of the deal. If both of these medications are taken in the amounts shown, the result will be equal relief, and this is the maximum effect for each drug. So again, this isn't the best example because you don't really know, but we're seeing two big pink ones and one little purple one. So if you take this little purple one or these two big pink ones, you get the exact same effect. So the efficacy is the same. Which one's more potent? Well, we don't exactly know how much of that be, but I mean, just based on size, I would feel pretty confident saying that that little Tylenol cold little purple pill is more potent than the two big pink ones, but they're equally effective. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So when we kind of um, apply this to trials, we know that a couple things complicate human clinical trials tremendously. One is the placebo effect. So if you dive, if you're interested in this, this is a fascinating subject to look into. So the placebo effect, so the place, a placebo again is just in a blank. It's an inactive substance and it's given for, in, in terms of experimental design, it's given to, to, to set up your control, right? So this is the non-treatment group. They get a control. So if we think back to that, um, that advertisement we saw calling for people who are currently taking Ambien. If you remember at the end of that, they said that you have to, to enroll in the study, you have to be willing to stop taking Ambien, which means that half the people that are getting enrolled in that study, pardon me, are gonna be given Ambien for whatever reason they were testing it, right? It was outside of sleep. Um, Cause they said they wanted to t test the medication for a different clinical use. And the other half, Everyone who's enrolled was taking Ambien. That was one of the that was one of the criteria to enroll in the study. But half of them are going to stay on Ambien, and half of them are going to be given a placebo. And nobody knows in a double a random double blind, nobody knows who's who, who's getting what, right? So that would be the best. But the thing that really screws this up is the placebo. The placebo effect, depending on what research resource you read, the placebo effect generally it comes in at about 35% of people given a placebo will feel better. That's crazy, right? So if you're designing this study and you're giving, you're half your group is getting a placebo, but 35% of those people are gonna feel better or worse, or they're gonna feel something based on, their, on the placebo. So that really makes things challenging. And the psychology around that is something that we don't have time to talk about, but is fascinating. And I would love to talk more about it. Um, so that throws things, that, that th th throws a wrench in this whole thing, right? If you've got a double-blinded situation and nobody knows who's got what, and you've got 35% of your test group's going to feel something with the placebo, it really messes up your data. So that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing that makes this hard is in a truly... In a true double blind, randomized, double blind, randomized controlled study, every, you know, this is with when you learned about a hypothesis, everything has to be the same. I mean, pardon me, when you learned about the scientific method, everything has to be the same. The only variable that changes is one variable. So 
when you get these big clinical trials to be a perfect study, everyone would have to be the same age, they would have to be the same sex, they would have to have the same severity of disease, they would have to be the same amount of control of degree of compliance, right? As you can imagine, this can be really complicated and oftentimes impossible to determine. And then you throw in that placebo effect and it just makes this whole thing challenging. Um, so uh, another thing that sometimes is done is they do what we call a crossover study. So this helps a little bit. So basically at some point, so let's go back to our Ambien example. So we've got two groups, one group's getting the placebo, one group's getting Ambien. At some point in the duration of the study, they're going to flip them. So the people that were getting the placebo are going to get the Ambien, the people that are getting the Ambien are going to get the placebo. Theoretically, nobody should know who's what, right? So the researchers shouldn't know who's got what at what time. So that, you know, that really can mess things up. So that's another, the crossover study is another way to sort of try to minimize these limitations. Um... Sometimes another thing they'll do is they'll throw in, the, in the mixture of the control, they'll throw in something that can cause a side effect, but no therapeutic value, right? So if they feel a side effect, right, they they think they're getting the drug and, you know, this, you know, we have to kind of take in human psychology into this whole thing, which is something that's astoundingly difficult to sort of understand. But... You know, the, the idea here is that you will minimize the placebo effect if they actually have some, you know, so like, let's say they're, they're on, they're getting the control, but then they get a nauseous or they get a headache or they get a dry mouth or whatever, then, you know, they're not really getting the drug, but they think they're getting the drug. And that makes them feel, I don't know, it can change the way that they report their, their um, symptoms. Okay, um, and then finally, a good study should always compare the test drug to the current drug of choice. So if you're comparing, you know, it's comparing apples to apples. It doesn't make sense if you've got a placebo and a new drug and you're just comparing those two. What you really need to do is then take the, new, the data from the new drug and compare it to the drug of choice. And that really helps to decide if this is really something that we should be pursuing or not. All right, so remember that this all starts off with lab and animal data. And, and um, you know, we take the data from the animals and then we extrapolate it and, and decide, oh, yeah, we should try this on humans. But there's lots of things that are different about animals and humans, right? And so sometimes that's going to change the response, right? Some organisms aren't going to respond in the same way. Um, different species are going to respond differently. And the other thing is that I think is really important in, in terms of the, some of these untoward effects you know, when we start with these human trials, you think like, wow, gosh, this, especially something that's not going that well, you think, gosh, you would have seen some of this in the animals, but animals can't really report untoward effects. And an interesting study in 1966, which is old, but it's still interesting, really old, um, is they basically um, did a study on 11,000 patients and identified the 45 most common drug-induced side effects. Of those 45, half of them would not have been recognized in animals. You know, like animals aren't going to say like, oh, I have a headache, or oh, my this makes my mouth dry, or oh, I feel depressed, or whatever. Like animal, you can't get that from an animal, right? You know, you can sort of say, oh, that little hamster is not running on the wheel and maybe they're depressed, but you're that's you're projecting that. You don't really know. Maybe it doesn't feel, you know, there's lots of things that we can't, we can't get out of that information. And so that is something I think that we want to kind of consider when we think about these phase one and phase two human clinical trials. All right, so, and that's kind of what I was just talking about there, that last bullet. And that, this is, becomes especially important in, for our central nervous system drugs, which are some of the most second, probably currently the second most common drugs are CNS drugs, most commonly prescribed. Second only to probably statin drugs for cholesterol. 
All right, so, um, and then once we get on, get, get these drugs to the market, there's the long-term effects are kind of hard to, to study, right? And, and this all comes down to how many people and how long they're taking it. You gotta have a lot of people on drugs for a long time before you see some of these long-term effects. And an example of this was um, with diethyl selbestrol, which was just as abbreviated DES, which was taken by um, a lot of people between 1948 to 1971. And so I actually, DES, I believe they were giving for morning sickness. I think I mis might have misspoken when I was talking about thalidomide. Let's see here, I'll tell you really quick. Consulting my handy dandy. So essentially, um, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, first synthesized in 1938. And it was, an, it's an indisc endocrine disruptor yeah. It, okay, so DES was given to pregnant women, believing that it would reduce pregnant C complications, which I believe was morning sickness and miscarriage. Um, so anyway, in 1970, so from 1948 to 1971, but in 1970, the rumor has it that two physicians at Mass General were talking in the elevator and they were talking about two cases of young women of similar age that had vaginal cancer, which is pretty unheard of in this age group. And it turns out that, you know, in the process, they learned that their mothers, both of the mothers of these young women had been given DES. And then since then that they started looking into it and then they also know that so women children of des women have a higher women female children of des women have a higher much higher risk of vaginal cancer and men of des women sons of of des women have a higher chance of infertility and also testicular disorders and this has everything to do with this endocrine disruption of diethyl um diethyl silvesterol Right. And they didn't know that because, you know, they're giving them to they're pregnant and they're, these are their kids. So we're talking like years out. Right. So this is the argument for continued testing and monitoring well into that post-marketing surveillance phase. So back to that efficacy and um, potency, which one's harder to prove long term efficacy or long term potency or safety? Pardon me. Um, probably the harder to prove is the long-term safety, right? Because again, you gotta, when someone's taking something for a long time, like in that case I just gave you, like the mothers took the medications, the, the women didn't, the women with the vaginal cancer didn't, but their mothers did. And so it was this way, way down the line before we saw these safety concerns come up. All right. Um, I think we've kind of covered this. This is against individual differences in humans. We know patients are not the same. Everybody is different. Everybody is an individual. Their genetics are different. We're learning more and more about that. Um, sometimes medications appear to be better than they really are. Sometimes they, they other times they appear to be worse than they really are. Um, so that's something that we need to think about. A good example of the sometimes they appear worse than they usually are is um, an example around levodopa. Levodopa is the drug of choice for Parkinson's that was almost rejected because the initial patients didn't respond. Why? I don't know. Maybe it was genetics. Who knows what the situation was? Maybe they weren't giving it enough. I don't exactly know the history of that, but I know that they almost dumped what has what is now our drug of choice for Parkinson's. So there's a lot of things to consider when we think about drug testing. Um, and human clinical trials. So hopefully that made some sense. If you have any questions about any of that, let me know. Um, I'm gonna cut this video here and then we're gonna come back for just one quick wrap up of this unit one, which is gonna be mostly some terms and just some co general concepts.